If you have a copy of God's Word, if you will turn with me to John chapter 14 this morning. John chapter 14. We're going to read verses 12 through 14 together, and then we'll be in some other passages of Scripture this morning as we walk through this section. Years ago, William Edward Perry was a famous English explorer, and he is responsible for mapping out most of the southern polar cap. Many of his maps are still actually in use today by those who travel to that uh, desolate sub-zero um, continent. Uh, on one particular expedition, while he and his team were there mapping this out, he and his crew completed mapping an uncharted region and they were preparing to hike to another unfamiliar location. They'd not been there before. They'd not done any uh, kind of pre-mapping trips or anything like that. So on the eve of their departure, they studied the stars and they were attempting to determine their exact coordinates. And as the sun rose, they began the hard, lengthy journey north to that unmapped region of Antarctica. Uh, they marched through the ice, through the snow, all day long with freezing air, burning their lungs, and as sunset kind of came upon them, they made camp completely exhausted after an entire journey in that type of situation and conditions. And after their evening meal, Mr. Perry studied the stars again to kind of determine, again, their exact coordinates and to see where they needed to go. And he was stunned to learn that even though he and his crew had been moving north all day long in that treacherous atmosphere, they were now further south than they had been when they started their journey. And he began to study this and research it and trying to figure out how could we possibly have been moving north all day only to end up further south with our coordinates than we had been previously. And what they discovered was even though they'd been traveling north, they were actually on a giant ice flow that had been moving faster south the whole time they'd been marching north. So they were further north on this ice flow, but further south on the continent. While they thought they were going in the right direction, they were slip sliding away and didn't even know that that's what they were doing. They didn't realize that the entirety of the ground that they were standing on was actually moving in a different direction. It really does matter your foundation. It really does matter where you start and how you are actually moving and what you're doing and what you're attempting to accomplish. You, you know, sometimes we may step back as a church and say, what is it that actually makes what we're attempting to do stick or for us to head in the right direction? I mean, it's not enough just to be religious about doing certain things. It's not enough just to go through the motions. It's not even enough just to do the right things. At the end of the day, we, we actually have to ask ourselves, is God in this at all? Are we really doing what God has called us to do? Or are we just kind of going through the motions of what we think church really is about? Maybe we would ask it this way. Why would God use our church corporately? Now, I want to I define some terms here. When we talk about church, what are we actually talking about? We're talking about the body of believers that gather together corporately in this place. It wouldn't matter if the building was here. It wouldn't make any difference uh, if all these things were gone tomorrow. The church would still exist because the church is God's gathered people. But then there's another question for us to ask. Why would God use us individually? Why would he use us corporately? But why would he use us individually? I want us to look today at a passage of Scripture where Jesus basically lays out that there's a greater work that needs to be done. Uh, a greater work that is on the horizon, that we actually are in the midst of, that we are to be a part of, that we're headed in that direction, in the direction that Jesus himself has called us to. And so in verse 12 of John chapter 14, this is what Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father." Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will 
do it. Jesus promises here a greater work there in verse number 12 for those who believe in him. The gathered group of believers. For those who would ask in his name, he promises a greater work. Now, greater does not mean more power. We just sang about the power of Jesus. Nobody has more power than him. Greater does not mean more knowledge. He certainly knows more than we do. You can't have more power, more knowledge than Jesus. So what exactly is he saying here? Greater has to do with the extent. Jesus' ministry was limited to three years in a specific geographic location range within the Middle East. And what he's saying is the church, the body of believers, has the mandate now to not just go to a central location, but to go to all the world. He's called us to go and be his hands and feet, to go and be his church, to go and be his body into all of the world. So the extent of what he's called us to is far greater than the area that he actually spent time in. Sometimes the biggest line that is the most difficult for us to cross isn't some major geopolitical uh, boundary. Sometimes it's a property line. Sometimes the great work that he's called us to individually may be our backyard. It may be to our neighbor across the street. It may be to our coworker in the cubicle next to us. It may be to our friend who's riding in the golf cart next to us or to our friend who's in the beauty shop in, under the hairdryer there. And we, we may have a more difficult time crossing those lines than we would geopolitical lines. What if everyone in the church took it upon themselves to actually go and do what Jesus has called us to do, which is to take the gospel out into the highways and the byways, to go out into our neighborhoods and our community, that we really did get serious about this whole who's your one mandate for us, that we would be looking to the next person to actually share the gospel with. Well, if we're going to do that, there's some things it's going to require. First of all, you must move and work. If we're going to see a greater work, it requires us to move and work. It requires us to actually get up and go and do. You can't sit and expect all of this to happen. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. Now, we spend a lot of time kind of emphasizing in the church calendar the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. It gets a lot of attention, and rightly so. It should get a lot of attention. We celebrate Jesus' birth at Christmas. We remember Jesus' death on Good Friday. We celebrate Jesus' resurrection on Easter, and we actually talk about it quite a bit throughout the year. But the ascension is not nearly as celebrated. It's interesting that we don't spend quite... There is an Ascension Sunday, by the way. I don't know if anybody knows when that is. I'm sure it's on the tip of your tongue this morning. But we we do have it in our kind of our ecumenical calendar that we think about from time to time. But for the most part, we don't spend a lot of time talking about the Ascension. But the Ascension is a vital part of what we've been called to do. It's the last words of Jesus before he ascends back to heaven. It's his charge to us to go and be the church, not just to go and participate in church-like things, but for us to actually do what he has called us to do. When you watch one of our space shuttles that launch at night, I don't know if you've ever paid attention to it, but if you ever take the time to watch a space shuttle or a rocket uh, launch at nighttime, there's this brilliant trail of light that follows behind it. It's, It's just amazing to watch those things. There's so much engineering and so much planning that goes into that one moment. But you know the interesting thing, there there is somewhere, somebody sitting at a desk where there's a big red button. Somebody has to push the red button for all that stuff to happen. Now, all of the pre-planning and all of the stuff that goes on in the midst of that, uh, is, it gets all of the fanfare. But at some point, somebody actually has to say, okay, go. There's the countdown, and then the button gets pressed. They've never asked me to press the button. I'd be happy to press the button if they want me to. I'll press all of the buttons. I'll just go through there and press them all until I get to the one that actually does what's supposed to happen. But nobody's ever asked me to do that. But somebody has to do it. 
Somebody has to press the button. You know the ascension was God pressing the button for his church to launch out into the world to do the work that Jesus had come to prepare for us to be able to do. It, it didn't make any difference if Jesus wasn't born, didn't live a perfect life, didn't die on the cross and wasn't raised again. But the ascension was God pressing the button to launch his church into the world to be the church, to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, to baptize people and to teach them everything that he had commanded us. In Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, Scripture says, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. It's really kind of an interesting moment, but here's, here's the setting, here's the situation. Jesus gives them their final challenge their final commission before he leaves and then he ascends back to heaven and you know what they do for a time they stand there and they just look up and i feel like so many times in in the life of god's church we're just standing looking up there's nothing wrong with that but at some point you can't just keep looking up waiting that they started by saying, hey, is now, is now the time you're going to usher in the kingdom? And now he goes back to heaven, and, and they're like, okay, w- what now? When will he come again? What, what's happening next? And so many people are just standing, waiting, or in some cases, sitting and waiting. Now, check out what happens next. Two angels show up on the scene. Acts chapter 1, verses 10 through 11, And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, Behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? The the angels show up and they ask this question. What are you doing standing around? He, He just told you what you were supposed to do. Get to work. The time for standing and gazing has passed. You know, an inactive Christian does not understand the significance of the ascension doesn't understand the importance of jesus commission and ascending to the father i will tell you this without jesus at the right hand of the father without jesus making intercession for us without the work of jesus while he was here and now while he is in heaven there is no point in us doing anything but because of what jesus has done everything that he's called us to do is possible not because of us but because of him It doesn't make any sense for our response to that to be, okay, well, if we get around to it, then we'll try to do something. No, he's called us to move and to work. So an inactive Christian is not going to understand the significance of the ascension, and it's not really going to make a whole lot of difference in their lives or anyone else's life. But an inward-focused church will never be a great church on the move as well because we've been called to go out into all nations We've been called to go across the street. Notice their response. It's not in Acts chapter 1. You actually get it in Luke chapter 24, verses 52 through 53. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. They began to worship him together. They went back to Jerusalem. The disciples moved after being rebuked by the angel. They worshipped They have great joy, and then eventually, of course, the whole point of the book of Acts was they took the gospel into all the world. The acts of the Holy Holy Spirit in the lives of the apostles, a totally inappropriate response to Jesus, standing around and staring. That's why the angels came and said, why are you gazing into heaven? I mean, he'll come back, but there's work to be done before that. So believers that honor God are on the move. Two questions for us to ask ourselves as we think about working and moving. First of all, it really begins with this. Do you believe? Do you believe? It's kind of an introspective question for all of us to 
sort of chew on this morning. Do you believe? If you believe, then there ought to be something that follows that. Belief always affects our behavior. So not just do you believe, but also do you serve? If you believe, then you'll serve. All those that follow Jesus do his works. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. It's not complicated, but sometimes it's difficult to kind of spur us on to participate in that. That if we really believe Jesus is who he says he is, if we really believe what the Bible tells us about him, if, if we truly believe that Jesus has saved us from our own sin, failures and mistakes, he has redeemed us and reconciled us to God. He has made us righteous, not because of our works, but because of his works. If we really believe those things, then it will affect what we do after we have been reconciled and how we respond to that. It is required that we would not just sit around staring into heaven, but that we would actually move and work. It also means that we understand the importance of being a part of God's fellowship, of His children, of His church. And so it requires that we would also attend and invite. In verses 13 through 14, he says, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I'll do it. You know, when they first moved, the first thing they did was to go back to Jerusalem, to the temple, together to worship and to bless God. That was their first response. That's the first and best response for all of us. When we understand what Jesus has done in our life, our life ought to be a Romans 12, 1 and 2 type response that we would offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, that we would worship Him with every Everything that we are. But then he calls us to take that message of reconciliation that he's given to us into the world. Paul said we will be his messengers of reconciliation, that we carry that message into the world. Sometimes, like we said earlier, the hardest boundary to cross isn't some major foreign boundary in another country. Sometimes it's a property line. And we have to be willing to love our neighbor. Here's where it starts. We attend because we love our neighbors that are fellow believers. That's really where it begins. We need each other to do this. I can't do it without you. You can't do it without me. We can't do it without each other. The church is the gathered body of believers. That's the purpose of the church is to come together, to worship God, to build up each other, to encourage one another, to hold each other accountable. But to hold each other accountable to what? To hold each other accountable to worship, to prayer, to Bible study, to spiritual growth and maturity, which also requires us to go and be missionaries. That's what he's called us to do. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 through 25 says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day, the return of Christ, drawing near. Don't stand around looking up into heaven waiting on the return of Christ. No, know that it's coming one day and until that happens we have things to do. A few principles that are found in that particular text in Hebrews is this. If you care about people, if you care about the church, if you care about fellow believers, you'll be at church. I mean I understand that I'm kind of preaching to the choir. You're here, right? So why would I need to tell you you need to be at church? Well, sometimes it's really easy for us to figure reasons why we don't have to be at church. But it seemed to be very important to the author of Hebrews to remind us that we are to be concerned about one another. Ourselves, we need to be around other believers because we we ought to be concerned about ourselves and we need that spiritual growth and maturity that comes from being around others. But we also ought to be concerned about our fellow believers to promote love, to encourage one another. How? Through the church. That that was the gift that God gave to us was each other. Some will habitually stay away from church. 
We'll figure every reason in the world why we can't go to church. But that's not healthy. Scripture obviously informs us that that's not healthy, and that's one of the wonderful accountabilities of being in church. That's why when you miss church, hopefully somebody calls you and says, hey, where you been? We miss you. What they really mean by that, and hopefully they do mean that they miss you, but the, the other kind of implied response is, hey, by the way, you miss us too. You don't even know it. But that day drawing near, if we believe Christ has come and done what the Bible says that he did, we also believe that he's coming again. And if that's true, then it's even more critical that we do the work that the body of Christ has been called to do. Church attendance is like exercise. If you do it twice a year, it hurts really bad. I mean, I, people come and, and they'll come whenever it is, but a lot of times on holidays and they'll come and sometimes we'll get those responses of how convicting the message was or how painful the message was. You know, if you're, if you're in church consistently, then the messages that are preached and proclaimed and taught and discussed in, in our Bible studies and in our worship services, they're not as painful. You know why they're not as painful? Because we're exercising together, walking through this, attending, participating. You don't remember any one workout unless you only do one workout a year. Then you never forget it. It's almost impossible to be what God's called you to be if you're just going to kind of put in the work occasionally. You do see the cumulative effects of working out over time. The same is true with spiritual disciplines. Prayer, reading God's Word, being in fellowship with other believers, worshiping together with others is required. That's why that was the first response of the disciples. Stop looking into heaven. So what did they do? They went back to Jerusalem and they worshiped. They went back to him and they gathered together to recognize that the only reason they had any hope, the only reason they were able to do anything that God had called them to do was because of what Jesus had done. If you ever lose sight of that, you will lose sight of what you can accomplish. That's why he says, anything you ask in my name, I will give to you. This I will do. Why? So that the Father may be glorified. This has never been about your ability. It's always been about His ability. So how do we respond? What does He tell us? First of all, He asks us this question. Do you pray? I was convicted of this as we uh, were preparing for our time uh, a few weeks ago when we were going to have a lot of different people on our, our, our campus here in Ocala. And I was, I was convicted because we do some events, we do a lot of events, and sometimes we forget that all of these events are useless if we are only relying upon our ability and our power and we're dependent upon ourselves. And Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. We've got a lot of agendas. We've got a lot of hopes and dreams and things of that nature. And I do want us to kind of back away from the whole idea of the church growth stuff. We're really not interested in growing numerical um, statistics and data in any of our campuses, in any of our services. But what we are interested in doing is taking the gospel of Jesus to the ends of the earth. Sharing the gospel with our one and then hopefully subsequent ones that will come after that. But then taking advantage of every opportunity, not just to share the gospel with them, but to introduce them to other believers and to say this is what it looks like to be a part of a family of faith where God is doing a great work and, and for him to be able to stir up in their heart. Because we can't save people. If your one is dependent upon you saving them, then they will spend eternity separated from God. We must recognize our dependence upon him. Do you pray and do you respond to whatever happens? However God responds to your prayer, do you worship him? And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. We're continually in the temple blessing God. This is how the disciples responded to to the angels who said, stop gazing into heaven. Go and do what he's called you to do. We have to be willing to go and to do. It's the reason why we want to put such an emphasis on reaching out into our community. Now, I do want to share with you this morning that inviting people to come with you to church, believers and non-believers, churched and unchurched, sometimes it's some of our church people that have kind of drifted away. Sometimes it's some of our people in our community that don't have a church that they attend anywhere. 
But inviting them to church is not the same as sharing the gospel with them. What we really are wanting to emphasize in the Who's Your One campaign is that you would be willing to take the gospel that has transformed your life to them. But we also want to give you an opportunity to invite them to come to God's house and to be able to hear the gospel and to be able to uh, be around believers. And so we want you to go and to invite them to come and to be a part of what God is doing here. Dr. Martin Namoller was an outstanding German pastor during the time of Adolf Hitler in Germany. Namoller was sent to prison for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and before being sent to prison, he had a 30-minute visit with Adolf Hitler. Hitler tried to persuade him to join the forces and to turn away from Christianity, which he termed to be just stupid nonsense. For 30 minutes, they discussed philosophy and the ideologies of the Nazis. Neymuller would not give up his faith in Jesus Christ, and so Hitler sentenced him to prison. Years later, when he was released from prison, he testified that he had visions that had haunted him for years. He dreamed that he saw Hitler standing before the judgment seat of God, and he said, I was standing off to the side watching the panorama of the events. In his vision, he saw Christ turn to Hitler and say, what is the excuse for your crimes? And in reply, in the dream, Hitler says, no one ever shared with me the gospel. Neymar said, well, I don't know if that was true or not, but here's what I do know. He said, I wasted 30 minutes arguing philosophy and ideology with Hitler. And I never took the time to share Jesus Christ with him in the 30 minutes that I had in his presence. And I've never forgotten it. Well, here, here's what I don't know. I don't know what would have happened if he had shared the gospel instead of arguing philosophy. But I do know this. Nobody's ever been saved because of agreeing with someone else's philosophy. No one has ever encountered the gospel of Jesus Christ by just talking about ideological or political agenda items. At the end of the day, friends, if we don't actually take the gospel of Jesus into the world to our neighbors, to our co-workers, to our friends, to our family members, to our children, to our grandparents, if we don't actually take that message to them, who will? I mean, at some point, we have to be responsible for this greater work that Jesus has delivered to us and say, we must be willing to move and to work. We must be willing to attend and be built up and then to go out and to invite them to respond to Christ. We must take the message that has radically changed our life and deliver it to those who desperately need for them to. We have no control over whether they will respond positively or not. He's not called us to manipulate people into a positive response. He's called us to go and take the message to the ends of the earth. You either do it or you don't do it. But we can't just stand around and look up into heaven and wait. Everyone should have at least one person that they are reaching. Someone in your life that is lost without faith in Christ. Someone that's unchurched or maybe even just de-churched or maybe they've been desensitized to church or maybe they've been hurt in church and we must introduce them to not what they historically have known but we must introduce them to Jesus and to his body that is to be serving working striving for him we want to give you an opportunity to remind you that it's not just enough to pray for your one, that's good, but at some point you actually have to talk to your one. You actually have to share with them. Share with them your personal testimony. And yeah, we want to give you a chance to invite them to come to worship with you, to see you with your gathered body of believers lifting up the name of Jesus so that the Holy Spirit may through your testimony, through the services, through the work of the Holy Spirit, may draw them to Him. Now, they may or may not respond to that, but that's not what you're responsible for. You're responsible 
for inviting them to Jesus. I don't know whether or not you have already done so. I know that, uh, that the one that God had laid upon my heart that I've been trying to share the gospel with has been very open and receptive to it, and yet at the same time, not willing to receive the gospel at this point. I keep praying and I keep sharing. We keep talking and I continue to trust the Holy Spirit because it's not up to me to save. It's just up to me to share. A greater work begins with who's the next one. Maybe you're here today and you would say, I don't know that I can share the gospel with someone because I'm not sure that I've ever really responded to it. Then it wouldn't make any sense for you to go and share the gospel with someone until you have allowed the gospel to grip your heart and soul, until you have repented and believed. That's why Jesus said to those who believe in me. Maybe you're here today and you need to respond by surrendering to him. Maybe you're here today and you need to respond by just falling on your knees before him and saying, I've been spending too much time gazing into heaven waiting, waiting for you to do for me. Whatever the response to the Holy Spirit is today, I pray that you will surrender And say to him, I want to do what you want me to do. I want to be a part of this greater work you've called me to. Father, in your name, here's my life. Do with it as you see fit. Would you bow your heads with me this morning as we pray?